Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. Hopefully you are all pouring in. Join us now. Welcome, welcome. I can see attendees numbers are rising. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've had a beautiful day like we have. The sunshine has been lovely. I hope you've been enjoying it and busy outside as much as you can be. And it's been so nice weather down here. Attendees are still going up. So we're just going to let everybody come in, let everybody get ready, and then we will start our session properly. So it's lovely to have you back. We've missed you. We've missed you all. Let's see. I can see some chat in the in the little chat bar perfect hello everybody hello jenna and lilia hello timmy and izzy hello michael hi ruby hi polly hi lauren hello everybody hi john and asha hi beatrix and michael hello everybody i can see lots of names hi brian and pippa and nick and rowan hello everybody oh perfect lots of attendees coming in we'll let it go a little bit more before we get there before we start our session. Perfect. Hello, Lauren. Hi, Ruben. Hello. Oh, you grew daffodils. That's nice. Little things coming into the chat. Hello, Iona. Hello, everyone. Perfect. All right. We'll let you come in. We'll let you get settled. Get a drink if you're thirsty. It's been a warm day. Get comfortable because we get a little bit longer. We can actually go a little bit longer now since we're only doing monthly sessions. So there's no rush. We can take our time, do all the fun things. Hi, Jesse. Hello. Brilliant. Let's get everybody in and settled and welcome. Oh, it's so nice to be back. I've missed our lovely explorers at home. Mm -hmm. So have okay. I. I've been counting down for this too. one. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. Me too. Have you guys missed it? Yeah, Michael says he's missed it. Well, welcome back. Thank you, John and Asha. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, Lauren. In fact, Lauren, I believe it was your idea, the theme for this session. I know that you've mentioned it in the chat and I think it was you who suggested it. And uh, so here we are now running a whole session from your idea, which we love that much. We'll introduce the theme to everybody else in a minute once we're comfortable. Let's see, I think our attendees are just settling down now. So we'll be ready to go in a minute. Jenna and Lily have missed it a lot. Well, we've missed you too, but we're back. We haven't gone anywhere. It's still happening. We've still got lots more planned. So this is never going to end if we get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, Lizzie, shall we start? Let's do it. Let's do it. So hi, guys. Nice to see you all again. Um, thank you for saying hi in the chat like you just did. And welcome to Explorers at Home. <laughs> Um, so my name is Lizzie and to my side, I don't know which one she is, she is Chelsea. Hello, <laughs> um, hiya. Together we do Explorers at Home, um, not what used to be weekly, now it's monthly. Um, so we work for Surrey Wildlife Trust and we even saw some of you guys at the weekend at our open day, so hello. Um, and it's just so nice to see all of you and even some new names as well. So Josie is going to show you guys how to get involved if you don't know already and if you are new. And if you've heard it before, sit back and take a listen and be reminded. <laughs> Perfect. Right, let me flip to the page because obviously I'm on the one page. I was chatting to people in the chat about when our birthdays are because they're similar. Uh, okay, so what I need to be telling you is that this session will be recorded and it will go on our website. Um, you don't need to worry about that though because you're you are muted now and your cameras are off so we can't see you we can't hear you you can be as comfortable as you like but you can still get in touch with us as you, you've probably guessed we can all see what you're doing in the chat so uh, you can message us in there all you have to do is t uh, click the little speech bubble at the bottom and then type your message to us press enter and we can see your messages there so if you're new today welcome click that or tap that chat button, send us a hello, and we can uh, say hello to you properly in the chat. We can see your messages there. You probably can't see each other's messages and that's how it will stay, but we can see yours. So if we can't reply to you in time, it's probably because it's quite busy in the chat. So you're probably going to be uh, people chatting everywhere and we'll struggle, but we'll do our best to reply when we can, but sorry if we can't reply to everybody all the time especially all the birthdays, which I'm now being told. 
Um, we will also have polls, which are like little questionnaires, little questions that will pop up on the screen and you can tap your answers there and send us those. So it's a way that we play our games and ask you questions. If that doesn't work for you, don't worry, because we will always read out the questions anyway. And uh, if you're watching this back on the recording, you won't see the polls pop up either. But don't worry about that, because again, you can just play along. We'll ask the questions. You can always play along without the polls happening. All right. I think that's all I need to say, Lizzie. Is that right? I think so. That sounded good. Right. Amazing. Let's get started. Well, first of all, happy Earth Day, everyone. It is the day that we can celebrate our Earth, but we should really do it every day because it is awesome and it's where we live. And to kind of coincide with that, our session this week is all on climate change and the ways that hopefully we can help and how it affects some of our wildlife. So our first poll of the day is just for us to see what you guys know about it is um if it will come up it should come up in Shall a... i pop it up for you <laughs> yes please <laughs> here you go you should see that on your screen now but if it hasn't popped up don't worry lizzie's going to read it out and if you want to type your answers into the chat as well then we can see what you voted for and have a chat about it okay so the question is have you heard of climate change before their options are no a little bit, but I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> is there an yes, option there um, that says animals like crabs? I think there is, Joyce. <laughs> I think I've accidentally forgotten to get rid of one of the options from last week. So ignore the last one because that's very <laughs> confusing. <laughs> Apologies, guys. So the options are, <laughs> yes, I know all about it. Or a little bit, but I'm not sure what it is. Or no, you don't know what climate change is. It's just to let us know what- Well, there's an option that says animals like crabs for literally no reason and too few people have voted for that. So sorry. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, we no, always, fine. <laughs> we always like a <laughs> question in these though. So there we it's go. It's true. We the like answer. a laugh. What was the question <laughs> that had animals like crabs as, a, as an option? Was it? Oh, it was crepuscular. We were asking, mm -hmm. does anybody remember what crepuscular means from last, last, uh, it's not even last week, last month, that's a long time ago. If you can remember what crepuscular means, then I'll give you a clue, it's not animals like crabs. I'll be very impressed. We've got some people, we've got answers coming in. In a minute, I can share those results with everybody. So you can see, if you can see the poll, you'll see what people voted for. And if you can't see the poll, then Lizzie will give you a bit of description anyway. Ah, John and Asha remember, active at dawn and dusk. Yes, well done, guys. That's crepuscular, but we should probably go back to this this, this theme, shouldn't we? <laughs> okay, let's finish the polling, <laughs> Joe. let's do it. So we go. you guys can see, most of you guys um, know all about it. There's some of you that aren't sure, and there's also a couple of you that don't know what it is. So to make sure we're all sort of on the same page, I've got a little introduction to what it is in case you haven't heard of it. And hopefully it just means we all kind of understand what it's doing to the planet at the moment. So I'm gonna try and share my screen and hopefully it will come up on there for you guys. Right, it should come up now. Let us know if you can't see it at all, put it in the chat and we can um, try and help you if it's not on there. So the question is, what is climate change? And I think it's best to start with where we actually live. So we live here, this is Earth. We're on that um, Earth, that ball in space. Can you believe it's incredible? Um, and that's where we live. And we have all sorts of weather every day. It could be sun, it could be rain, it could be wind, and that changes daily. But climate is a bit different to that. Climate is like the weather overall. So if you imagine the Arctic is really cold, here we get all our seasons. And then in the desert, in the Sahara, it's really hot a lot of the time. So they're all really different places to live, but every single place there can have a bit of rain in a day. So, you know, we could rain in the Sahara for a day, it could rain where we are and also in the Arctic, but we know that they're all very different climates to live in. So hot, cold, and we're like an in-between, it's nice here. So that's kind of what climate is. And then Earth is surrounded by basically a big bubble of air. So this next picture shows that, and it's called our atmosphere. So it's like a big bubble surrounding us. And this is full of gases like oxygen that we breathe and 
uh, carbon dioxide which plants take in and they need to survive. And what those gases do, what this bubble of air does is it um, lets the sunlight and the heat into the earth, but it also um, keeps a little bit and lets some go. So it keeps us warm. If we didn't have this atmosphere bubble, it would be ice cold. We would not be able to live here at all. Nothing on earth could live here. So without it, we wouldn't be here. It's incredible. But the thing is, we are using lots of energy and power. So things like factories, driving our cars, um, heating our homes, all sorts of things that we do every day use, uses energy from fossil fuels like coal and oil. And these then release gases into the atmosphere like carbon dioxide. And that is what is starting to cause our climate to change because the more gases we have, um, the, our atmosphere changes a bit. So this next picture here, it's got Earth, it's got, you can see the bubble or atmosphere around it, and you can see the um, heat coming in, so that yellow wave. And what happens is the more carbon dioxide we have, changes what's in our atmosphere increases. And that means that it's like making our blanket or our bubble of air over Earth even thicker. And it's hard for the heat from the sun to escape like it used to, or as much of it to escape. And it means that our Earth is warming up a little bit. And even by warming up a little bit, it is completely changing everywhere on Earth. So our Arctic and the Antarctic, where it's really icy um, on top and at the bottom of the Earth, some of the ice is melting, which um, causes sea level rises. Even here in the UK, we're getting higher seas. And also it's causing things like extreme weathers, like droughts, where there's no rain at all for such a long period of time. Um, so it's affecting lots of different areas all over the globe, including the UK. So that's kind of what climate change is. Basically, um, there's things that we're doing that means that our Earth is warming up more than it can handle at the moment, really. So that's what it is. And this is what this session is all about. So we're looking at some of the creatures that might be affected by it, but we're also gonna be talking about ways that we can all help. So we want it to be quite positive and for you to go away and feel like you can definitely help even in the littlest way, smallest way. So that's that, okay. <laughs> that's so good, Leslie. What a great description of quite a hard thing to understand. If some of that didn't make sense to you, don't worry. It's quite a complicated thing. I mean, that's why there are super clever, very important scientists around the world studying this all the time. And here we are, little Surrey Wildlife Trust, just having a chat about it because we're experts too. We don't need to know everything to understand enough to know that we can make a difference too, which is what we're going to do today. Awesome. So like always, we like to uh, have a game and we like to start off with it. So that's what's going to happen next. It is our game. Game I'm time. I'm going to share the screen now. Hopefully let us know again if it doesn't come up for you guys. I'm just trying to find it. Yay, says everyone in the chat. Hooray, it's game time. <laughs> I'm glad everyone likes the game. Oh, we've got some brilliant questions. Can I do one quick question that's come in? Yeah, go for it. I'm trying to get it up. Ellie has asked, how can the sun's rays penetrate the atmosphere and not come out? And that's really interesting. It's because when the sun's rays come in, they're sort of one frequency, which is a fancy word for one type of wave. But when they bounce off of the earth, they change. And that type of wave can't get out of the atmosphere as easily as the one that came in can. So when they come straight from the sun, they can get in through the atmosphere, they go straight down. But once they hit the earth and bounce off, they go in all different directions and they change a little bit in really complicated ways that I can't explain personally. But I know that those rays change and then they can't get back out through the atmosphere the same way. Interesting. So it's a really good question. Yeah, that's a good idea, Ellie. She says, uh, so they become weaker-ish. Yeah, it might be because they lose energy, so they're not as powerful to be able to break back out again, and then they just bounce around. It is genuinely the same way that a greenhouse works. Uh, if you've ever been in a greenhouse in your garden or in someone else's garden, then it's a lovely glass little house. And on the outside, it's a nice weather, probably very sunny, but it could be cold. And you go inside and all the sun is coming in and it's getting really hot in there because that heat is building up. It's trapped 
inside the greenhouse. It really just is a very similar effect. Very cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I'm going to try and share it now. They're really good questions, though. Thank you. They're great, aren't they? Asking them. Okay, so our game is called Climate Creatures. Again, all to do with climate change. So we thought we'd start off with an animal that you always talk about or animals that you always talk about when you think about climate change. So for this game, each slide is going to have four pictures on it. And we're going to ask you a question on each one and there'll be different questions and we want you to try and work out the answer or give it a guess if you want just uh, you can either shout the number at the screen or click the answers below so each uh, picture has a number and the answers are with the numbers too so the question for this one is who is the biggest bear is it number one the grizzly bear number two the sloth bear Number three, the American black bear, or number four, the polar bear. So who do you think is our biggest bear on the screen at the moment? Have a guess, because I, I think if we'd be so lucky if we'd managed to see all four of these bears at some point. <laughs> that would be amazing. I'd love to see. Do you know, I've never seen a bear in the wild. I would absolutely love to see one. Really? That would be so cool. I have managed to see um, black bears before in Canada. Have you? Cool. That was a <gasps> breathtaking moment. And oh, I'm jealous. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. More brilliant questions coming into the chat. If you've got questions, do throw them in there because I can look at the chat after the whole session's ended. I can look back over it. And if we get lots of good scientific questions that we don't have time to answer now, and if I can't answer them all now, I will do what we did with the hedgehog session and I'll put them all together and we'll type up our answers and send them back with the email that we send out after the session. So if I don't get a chance to reply to your answers, uh, your questions in there, then I will do my best to afterwards. So don't worry if I can't answer now. All right, shall we see what everybody said to the first poll? Let's do it. Okay, let's share those results. Well, I think most of you guys said polar bear few grizzly and one or two black bear answers but the answer is the polar bear is our biggest bear so at least on the screen it's one of our biggest bears overall and these guys live in the arctic so remember i talked about the arctic earlier it's where there's lots of ice and they're born on land but they spend most of their lives out on the sea ice, so where it's frozen over, they hunt there, look at how well camouflaged they are for the ice as well. So they'll hunt things like seals. But obviously with climate change, if it's warming up, like on a hot day, if you had an ice cube, the ice on, this, on the surface where the polar bears live is melting. And that means they haven't got as much space to hunt. It's quite overcrowded, so there's quite a few bears all together. And normally that's not what happens. They like to have their own space. And it also means it's harder to hunt seals because if you imagine you used to have a big sheet of ice to um, hunt on, the seals wouldn't always see you coming. But if you're on smaller bits, they can see the polar bears a lot more and it means it's harder to catch food. So these guys are really struggling and that's who you tend to hear about when you talk about climate change is the polar bears. So that's why we wanted to start with it. It is a classic animal and one that is really suffering because of it. And they're incredible, look at them, gosh. But Beautiful animals, aren't they? They are. So we wanted to start with this one, but the rest of the animals that we're going to be talking about are all ones that we have here in the UK that are starting to or will be affected by climate change. So that was like our nice little introduction animal. Okay, nice work, guys. Next question is... Here we go. Um, which of these animals is an insect? Is it number one, the orb spider? Number two, the leopard slug? Number three, the ground beetle? Or number four, the millipede? So who is the insect? Maybe you guys have started to learn about these guys at school or you have learned about them already. And if you haven't and you don't know, give it a go, give it a try. got even more brilliant questions i'm trying to reply to as many as i can but again if i can't don't worry i will get back to you at some point we've got brilliant ones in here we've got lots of cool things somebody said have you ever heard of a pizzly bear isn't that a grizzly and a polar bear hybrid i've heard about them up in I heard about that as well. 
Yeah, amazing. <sighs> Look at yeah. these lovely insects though. It's nice to come back to Surrey. I love traveling the world in our in our club and in our adventures and our games. But I do like to come back to Surrey and have a look at our animals that we know a bit better in our special place because Surrey is amazing too. It is. It's incredible. And even just anywhere in the UK, we have such cool wildlife and we just like to celebrate it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Shall we see what everyone said? Let's do it. Here we go. Okay, so we've got a few votes millipedes, a few votes for the slug, and most of you guys said ground beetle, and I can happily say that um, you guys were right. The ground beetle is the insect in those pictures. He's got six legs and three body parts. That's a really big indicator. And the reason why we've got this guy as the answer is because even things like beetles are gonna be affected. These guys love living in woodlands where it's cool, where it's damp, so under logs, and just where it's shaded. And you think that that would be um, okay to live in even as it heats up, but even our woodlands are gonna warm. So these little creatures are gonna struggle too. So if you did want to help these guys, just putting in a log pile in your garden means that there's more space for them to live and to be able to move if it does get too hot. Um, it's just, that will help them as well. But they're incredible, these little ones. Okay. Next round. We've got four birds on the screen and the question is, which of these birds only comes to the UK in the summer so they don't spend the winter here? Is it the robin, number one, number two, the great tit, number three, the starling, or number four, the black cat? So which one just comes to the UK in the summer? Maybe you've seen some of these birds over winter and that might tell you that they do stay over or stay here all year. It's a difficult one because some birds do move around within the UK, but this one, the one that is the answer that we're looking for, goes all the way, I think it's it to Africa, it goes a long way away and then it comes back again in the summertime. It basically comes here for its holidays when the weather's nice and it doesn't bother to stick around when it gets snowy. <laughs> all right. Nearly done with our voting. Lots of ideas coming into the chat. Lots of good ideas. People getting help from family. That's absolutely fine. There's no such thing as cheating here because if you cheat and you look it up, it's called research and that's good. <laughs> also, we love that you talk to people about it. So go for yeah. it, anyone. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Right, three, two, one. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. So. We've got, had quite a few answers for starling and black cat and a few for robin and great tit. Well, the answer is that the black cat is the one that stays um, here in the summer and goes away in the winter, or at least that's what used to happen. So climate change has lots of negative effects, but it's also affecting some species in a slightly positive way. So this beautiful black cat, which gets its head from its little sort of black cap on top of its head, um, so it gets its name from it. Um, these guys, they used to spend winter away, but now because we're having slightly warmer winters and a little bit wetter as well, they actually think, oh, you know what? I could actually stay here over winter. And instead of flying all the way back to um, Africa or wherever, wherever they end up over the winter time. So we're actually seeing them more and more in the winter. And it's the same, not just with these guys, but also with chiffchaffs as well. So some birds are now staying all year round. Okay. Really good comments in the chat. We're being told yeah. that they save energy and it's because they get fed, which is absolutely right. It's because all of us lovely people put bird seed out and we put bird feeders out and we put fat balls out. And by doing that, we're helping to provide food for these birds, which would normally have to find food by literally flying over oceans to go somewhere else where it's warmer and there's still insects for them to eat. But by putting stuff out here, they can find enough food and they don't have to waste all that energy by flying somewhere else. For some species, that's good because it means that they can do better and be healthier all through the year and then have more babies and have bigger populations. And that's really good. But for some species, we don't want to just feed them all the time because then they're dependent on humans. And that's not necessarily a good thing because we are pretty unreliable. So it's definitely an interesting one. Do we try and improve habitats? 
so they can find more food for themselves or do we provide food so they can help themselves so that they can get some food with our help it's a big discussion that a lot of conservationists have all the time look at that beautiful bird oh and they have the most lovely song i just want to add that in if you hear <laughs> a lovely song it, they're already here some of them are back in the country now and you can hear them singing around i heard one at the pond earlier today at nowellwood and they sing so beautifully so it is worth listening out for nice songs and then you see a little little boring looking bird if we're honest flittering around in the bush with a bright black head and you go oh i know what that is and then you can say i'm an expert see i know all the birds mm -hmm. <laughs> but even the girls are a little different aren't they because they have oh, a brown hat so it's either yeah. a black or a brownie ready point on top. A little chestnut okay. hat. Right, next one, guys. Which of these is a da, 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 a butterfly? So we have number one, it's a brimstone something. Number two, it's a <laughs> garden tiger something. Number three is an elephant something. And number four is a cinnabar something. Now, we can't <laughs> finish the names or we'd give away the answer. <laughs> but have a go, have a guess. Which one do you think is the butterfly? I think they're all beautiful, no matter what. They're incredible. They're all trying to be colourful like butterflies, aren't they? Definitely. But which one is the real butterfly? Hmm. Lots of answers coming in and in the chat. We've got lots of ideas. Oh, someone went to Bird World last week. That must have been fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at these though. Aren't they stunning? And some of these, uh, which are moths, some of the ones which are moths, do fly around in the daytime too, which might explain partly their beautiful bright colours. They're really, really pretty. But I want to know which one's the butterfly. And you know, I think, Lizzie, looking at the answers as they're coming in, I think most people have got this right if you didn't don't worry because remember this is not a test you're not no. a school this is a game and it's okay to get things wrong because if you knew all the answers already there's not a lot of point in the play in the game so mm -hmm. i want to know what is the butterfly are we ready let's see so most of you guys said brimstone and we had some answers for the other three as well but you guys are right the brimstone the one in the top left is the butterfly so here it is now it's beautiful look at how gorgeous it is and it's one of the early butterflies the ones that come out first and let us know if you have seen one already they're normally a lovely yellow flittering about normally in woodlands and things that's where i've seen one already and they're one of the first sort of signs of spring they are incredible but the thing is even these guys are affected by our changing climate so because it's getting warmer these guys are coming out earlier than before so even if it's just a few days or a week they're kind of coming out of their hibernation over winter a lot earlier and that can be good it's good for us to see them but it's whether they have enough food because they're going to rely on all the flowers that come out and sometimes they aren't in sync so they might come out before there's enough food for them so this, these guys are affected by climate change also think about the fact that if they come out early and we have a cold spell like the snow we've just had then that's gonna affect our butterflies and they can't um, handle that shock of the cold that we have been having. So it's a bit of um, a bit of a bad, bad one for the butterflies, although it's good for us to see them. <laughs> it is lovely to see them. And do you know what? Maya and Kieran say that they learnt about brimstone butterflies at the Bluebell Festival at Nowwood that we had last Sunday. So, and they said that they saw us and it was lovely to see you. So isn't that magical? I love that. Mm -hmm. Nice now we're back open again. Hopefully we can welcome you all up to the woods soon, I hope. Okay, right, next one. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I had to change it. <laughs> <laughs> next question is, who here is the bee? If you guys have seen some of our previous sessions, this might remind you of those tricky mimics that like to copy other animals, and that's what's happened here. So who is the actual bumblebee? Is it number one, number two, number three, or number four? Have a guess, who do you think it is? We couldn't give the names of them in these answers because it would have completely given them away <laughs> because they're not even named like as if they were bees, they've all got their actual names. So we had to just say the photo numbers. 
Okay, I think we're nearly there. Five more seconds. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> awesome. So most of you guys said number two, and you were right. Number two is the bumblebee. We also have the bumblebee mimic hoverfly in number one. Number three is a wasp, and number four is another hoverfly. So there's some of them that like to pretend to be other creatures in the hopes that they won't get eaten because animals might think they sting them, like the hoverflies there. Amazing. And the reason why we have bumblebees as one of our answers is because, again, like with the butterflies, they might come out earlier. And again, cold spells aren't good for these guys. But also, bumblebees are quite big for an insect. They are fluffy and hairy and dark as well. And that means they absorb a lot of heat. And it's when it gets too hot, like when it gets too hot for us in the summer, they need to cool down. But if it gets too warm with climate change, these guys aren't going to find cool areas as easily anymore. And they can't travel as fast or as far as, as birds can. So they're going to struggle finding cool places to live. And also their plants that they rely on, um, they need to find too. So plants for food and places for shelter. So they can't just move anywhere. They have to have specific plants with them. So these guys hopefully will be okay. There is a way that you can help them. On hot sunny days, we know how we have bird baths where you can also have a bee bath. So a little dish with some rocks and pebbles in and some water and these will help the bees cool down and drink water. And also by making little sort of pollinator pit stops. So places for flowers in your garden, on your balcony, on your windowsill if you haven't got a garden. It all helps and it's like a little station for them to stop off that, get some energy and keep going to a place that's suitable to live. So those sort of things can really help our bumblebees. You know Lizzie, we've got a bird bath but I don't have a bee bath and I think that's something that my garden needs because it sounds really fun. So I'm going to make does. a bee bath. You could even put in um, those cute little gemstones that you get that you might have in like plant, uh, flower decorations or even marbles or rocks, whatever you find. You just fill it up so that there's some over the surface of the water and then the bee can go down, get a drink without drowning. <laughs> Amazing. You know what, Lizzie? Sorry, I've just got to rearrange my chair for a minute. I've just realised that it's actually well past half past and we have been chatting way too much. <laughs> oh, goodness, let's oh, get going. <laughs> we've lost the practice of the speedy, speedy quiz. And I've been replying to loads of questions. So I'm going to let the questions go for a bit and let's get on with the quiz. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. I think we've only got a couple left anyway. So the question is, which of these birds on the screen eats fish? Is it the great spotted woodpecker number one? two, the mute swan, three, the puffin, and four, the great tits. So who eats fish? Have a guess if you don't know. Um, give it a try. Talk to each other if you're with your sibling or parents. Have a discussion. Go for it. We're nearly there. Nearly everyone's voted. There's some clues in this one, aren't there? There's some clues about where these animals live. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Three, two, one. Let's have a look amazing so most of you guys said puffin and you are right now obviously we don't have puffins in Surrey but we do get them in the UK and actually where they do come in the UK are really important habitats for them because that's where they spend their summer and then they go back to the Arctic in the where it's a bit colder in the winter so the problem is we at the moment there's lots of overfishing done by humans us which means there's not as much food for them and then if you add in climate change it changes our seas and whether it's warm or cold and this is affecting where the fish are found and now there's just not enough fish for the puffins to eat especially as the seas are changing they're moving further and further away from where they can nest here in the UK um, so that's a bit of a trouble for them. So that was the puffin. <laughs> They're so beautiful. I'd love to see one. They are stunning. Absolutely stunning. Okay. This one is, which of these eats insects? There we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> number one, <laughs> the mayfly. Number two, the barn owl. Number three, the hedgehog. Number four, the adder. So who eats insects here? 
or who intentionally eats insects. Maybe someone might accidentally pick one up while eating something else, you never know. Okay. Guys are nearly done voting. Give it a try, even if you're not sure, give it a go. Maybe you might have never heard of a mayfly before. Who knows? You're about to learn. <laughs> You know, some of my questions are all about what our challenge is today, so uh, I don't even need to answer them because we're going to do it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, guys. <laughs> so most of you said hedgehog and you guys are right. So we had a mayfly who is a herbivore. He eats plants or she eats plants in the water. We have the barn owl, they eat small mammals, and the adder also eats small mammals and maybe even amphibians and things. So the hedgehog is the one that will intentionally eat lots of insects and other things too, like worms and things. And even hedgehogs are affected by climate change or they're thought to be, again, lots of people do research on this, but it's thought that with our sort of warmer autumns, some hedgehogs are starting to have two litters. So that means they had one earlier in the summer and had lots of hoglets, and now they're having a second one in the autumn and having more hoglets, which sounds great, but actually they have um, very little time to get ready to hibernate in the winter. So a lot of them don't survive. And also because it now is slightly warmer in the winters, some hedgehogs aren't hibernating throughout or maybe not even hibernating at all. And it's completely changing their behavior. Um, and obviously if it's um, if they're not hibernating, they're using lots of energy. So when there are really cold nights, they might go into a sort of a little hibernation, but they need to eat lots of food for that. And sometimes the insects and things that they eat aren't available. So um, with there's still lots of research to be done, but that's what's thought to be happening for them. And everyone's got to love a hedgehog. I mean, look Ellie and George have spotted a caterpillar in the corner of that picture. Can you see it? Is it the black one? Oh, is that a grass or is that a caterpillar? Oh, it could be the end of the grass, it could be a caterpillar. Sorry, I've distracted us again. Carry on, let's go. Okay. <laughs> and this is the last one, guys. So the question is, who, which of these birds catches food while flying? Is it one, the swallow, two, the wood pigeon, three, the heron, or four, the rook? And a rook is very similar to a crow, it's part of that family if you haven't seen one before. They have that silver beak, it's gorgeous. To go back to the very important caterpillar or grass question, everyone in the chat agrees that it was caterpillar. <laughs> it's a caterpillar then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. oh, nobody's nobody's voted for wood pigeon. Nobody thinks pigeons swoop around, catching food from the middle of the air, which is, to be honest, quite sensible. But at the same time, I feel bad for them now. <laughs> Nobody thinks that they could do it. Maybe a, a particularly quick pigeon could nip a moth out of the air. Or a berry out Maybe. of the Oh, one person, one person. <laughs> pigeon. Thank you, whoever you are, you're very kind. <laughs> OK, I think that's given. That's it. Perfect. So. The, most of the votes went to the swallow, but quite a few, few of you voted for heron as well. And herons, are, like it's doing there, like to hunt in the water like that. So that's how they tend to catch their food. And then they go really quickly into the water to catch fish and all sorts. And then like we thought, so the wood pigeon doesn't catch food while flying. And Especially the that one. It is fast asleep, <laughs> looking very chubby on a branch, which has been pointed out and it's, it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer was the <laughs> swallow. There we are. It's beautiful. These guys visit from South Africa. They fly so far to visit us here in the UK and in Europe. And they visit us in the summer. And even these guys are affected by climate change. And it's, in fact, they spend about four more weeks than they used to with us in the summer because our summers and autumns are now warmer. They can stay for longer before they have to go back back home, back down south in the winter. Um, so it means that we get to see them for that little bit longer and they can raise their young here and build their nests and things. So that is what's happening for swallows. Do you know my favourite swallow fact? Go for it. I always love sharing random facts, sorry everybody. But uh, when before people knew that they disappeared off to Africa in the winter time, it, they everybody in the UK was like, where have all the swallows gone? And the only sensible idea that they came up with was that they go flying, they're flying and flying and they 
dive bomb into muddy puddles and sleep at the bottom of a swampy, muddy bit of lake or something. <laughs> I mean, to us now, that seems absolutely mental. That's a ridiculous idea. But back in the, what was it? I think it's Victorian times they thought that. They thought it was absolutely correct. Why, what else would swallows do than dive bomb into the mud and sleep in there? <laughs> and then they they... crawl out in the spring <laughs> and somehow get clean and fly off again. Obviously. I was going to say, like, these guys, they don't like um, hunting or flying in wet weather. So why would they want to go in mud? <laughs> it's absolutely mad. Absolutely mad. Crazy. Nick has asked a good question. He says, how do birds fly that long without eating? And it's actually, <gasps> they do eat on the wing while they're going. They'll nip past the shrub and catch some insects and they will go. Uh, uh, basically, they do eat where they can. The interesting part, Nick, is that some birds fly over the ocean as part of their migration where there are fewer insects. And if they're not a seabird and they have to just cross an ocean to do part of their migration, they genuinely do have to just not eat for a long time. And that's why you see a lot of migratory birds, which are birds that go places for a long time, they often stock up on as much food as they can. It's like us eating all the cake that we can get our hands on to get as fat as we can so that we can then walk to Africa without eating, but using only the fat that we built up before when we did have lots of food it's very clever but they can lose up to a third of their body weight some species just by trying to fly those absolutely mad distances absolutely incredible, incredible. it's now That's quarter really two question. though so I, I should stop waffling <laughs> okay <laughs> so like with every session we have a craft as well and our craft this week is all to do with worms because they are spectacular we rely on them and so does the rest of the world. So worms mean that we have healthy soils for plants to grow and for us to grow crops. And worms are just really, really important in helping all our, like I said, plants to grow. And having plants means that it sucks, they suck up a lot of the carbon dioxide in the air. So the ones that are causing the climate change. So we need plants and therefore we need worms. So we our do need worms. We yes. always need worms. Worms give us the soil that gives us all of our food. Everything you had for lunch today, you would not have if we didn't have worms. So personally, I love them. I hope you do too. <laughs> so for this, we are making a little wormery and it's somewhere where you can keep worms for about a week and to see how cool they are and how they work and then you let them go. So for this, you need a two litre water bottle if you've got one or just wait until you get one and you can do this a bit later. Then you need a bit of soil or compost from the garden or park, and also a little bit of sand if you've got it, or just a different coloured soil will work as well. So they're the main things you need. And um, we are gonna give you a link on how to make this properly um, and gives you all the instructions. So don't worry if you can't remember everything. What we're gonna do is you want to cut a quarter of the bottle off. So I'm gonna cut it about there to chop it right off so give me one moment you might need your parents help and it's best to use scissors really but again ask your parents help if you um, need it because it can be quite sharp especially the plastic you can cover the plastic with a bit of um, tape as well if, you, if it is sharp for you that will make it a bit softer like how we did with our water viewers that we many weeks ago so the next thing you want to do is fill this up with soil and sand, alternating. So you go soil, sand, soil, sand. And that's what I'm gonna to attempt to do now. Again, it, will, it might go all over my desk and make it very messy, but here we go. So I'm gonna fill it up with a bit of soil. And you can get the soil from your garden or anywhere else that you go. If you haven't got a garden, maybe you've got a park. And when you are collecting the soil, you can collect a few worms to put in too. It's just really important to be gentle and kind to the worms. So they are quite delicate. You don't want to chop them in half or anything. You can find them under logs where it's damp or even um, in the soil, you can dig a small hole and then go through the soil that you've dug because they tend to be near the top a lot of the time before they go underneath. So as you can see, I did a bit, bit of soil, a bit of sand. I'm gonna do we put the worms in now, Lizzie, or do we wait to the end? Wait till the end. So once, oh, okay. possible. oh, and then as you go, you want to add a little bit of water each time. You're meant to spray it, but I don't have a spray. So I'm going to do a little trickle. And that's because worms like this to be damp. So each layer, you want to add a bit of water. 
going to add a little bit more sand and then top it off with soil. Hopefully you guys can see this and then a little bit more water. You don't want it to be too wet because they don't like really damp soil, a really wet soil. They just like it a little damp. Yeah, they don't want dry soil, do they? Because then they'll probably die. And nobody wants a plastic tub of dead worms. Nobody wants that. No, <laughs> definitely not. So that's roughly what it might look like for you guys. Then that's when you add your worms on top, which I have here. So I'm just going to put them in with a bit of soil. So I keep them happy while I chat with you guys through the game. And then once they're in, just put a couple in, you don't want to put too many, just um, about two or three. And you want to put some food in there for them too. How many worms was that, Lizzie? Because I think that's probably the thing we're all going to be tempted to <laughs> accidentally forget and put 50,000 worms in. It's just two or three, okay? You hear that, everybody. It's two or busy. three worms. We're not putting millions of worms in here, even if you're an expert worm catcher. <laughs> <laughs> Then you want to put some leaves on top. This is what they eat. They eat all the leaves that fall to the ground. And you can even put in a little bit of grated carrot if you want or some vegetable scraps. But the best thing for them is the leaves. That's their natural food. So once you've done all that, you then want to um, wash your hands after you've finished touching all the soil and sand. But you also want to make sure they stay in a warm place and also dark. So whether you have a dark room to put them in or you can use like a bit of cardboard and cover this so you can make a little contraption to cover it like that. Or you can put a towel over the top or something. You can also put this, so your leftover bottle lid on top as like a, um, a lid, but you wanna keep a bit of air open. So you make a little slit. Yeah, we want air in there, but we don't want it to dry out. So that lid will help it to keep the water in, but also to let air in, because it's really important that worms have got lots of air as well. You can even take the top off to add a little extra air. That will be good. So that's roughly how you make it. And then keep it in a dark place or in a warm place. And also keep checking to make sure it's damp. Add a little bit of water if you need to and make sure there's food for them. And then keep it for a week. And once you've had it for a week, you want to put them back where you found them. So um, take them back to whether it was your garden or if you went on a walk and found them and release them back there because they want to go back to their normal lives. We can't keep them forever. <laughs> yeah, that's really important. And I think a lot of people often forget that part. Exactly. Make sure you top up the leaves every now and then. Wet leaves are probably best and all those veggie scraps is a great idea. And you should see those layers mixing, shouldn't you, as the worms dig down. Exactly. So normally worms are sort of about here in the soil and then they come up to the surface, they'll grab food and they'll bring it down. And that's what you'll start to see is the sand and the soil will mix. And that is why they are so important because they mix all the soil around. It means there's lots of gaps for air to get in and for water. And this is what our plants need. This is what the roots need to grow in. So without worms, it would all stay the same and it'll be really hard to grow. So that's why we're doing the winery today. Brilliant. Very when Lizzie said stock. that it could be kept in a warm place, not too warm. Don't put it on a radiator. Don't put no. it so still in the sunshine. You want it to be somewhere sort of cool and comfortable. Nowhere that it will get too hot because the worms will just not be very happy or healthy. And remember, let them go at the end. Don't keep them forever because just like you, they might like a holiday, but they don't want to live somewhere else forever and ever when they've decided where their home is already. OK, I think what are we doing next? Oh, it's sound of the week, everybody. Come on, Lizzie, you know what to do. <clears throat> da, 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 da. <laughs> That's beautiful. I missed doing that. <laughs> Getting better at it every week. Right, I'm going to share sound only. And this time, I want you all to have a listen to this bird. It's a bird lots of you might hear around and about at the moment. And it is a bird with a very good name, a name that describes what it sounds like. So it's onomatopoeic. That's a big word. So it just means it sounds like what the word sounds like. And I want you to tell me the name of the bird if you know it. And if you don't know, doesn't matter. I want you to make up a name and type it in the chat. So see what would you name this bird? Is everybody ready? 
let's go. Very repetitive. <laughs> Lots of people know the correct name, which is very impressive. I like Maya and Kieran's idea of squeaker. <laughs> Still going. Screecher is a good one as well. Tweet tweet is a good suggestion. That's what it sounds like. Basically, it goes on like that for effectively ever. Beatrix would call it an up-down, which is a really good idea. That's what I would call it too, actually. I like that. And for everyone else, I'm so impressed. You seem to know what it's actually called. Everybody seems to know it's a chiff chaff. So let's quickly share my screen properly so you can all see the chiff chaff. Here we go. Lizzie, you'll have to keep an eye on the chat for me because I can't see the chat when I do this. I'll share computer sound as well. Here we go. Let's get that out of the way. Can you all see that? So they're pretty boring and brown. They've got a bit of pretty colour, a little bit of yellowy green, but there they go. And this is one of those birds, like the black cap. Shall I try and pause for it in a prettier view? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> like the black cap, who travel so far. They travel miles and miles and miles of migration, and they come here only in the summer when there's lots of food for them to eat. And this bird comes, and you hear it from about now until the end of summer, you'll hear them sitting in trees, you'll hear them everywhere. Chiff, 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 chaff, chiff, chiff, chaff, chiff, 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 chaff. And they just <laughs> go. At this time of year, I go, oh, it sounds like spring, it's so nice. And at the end of the year, I'm going, oh my goodness, will it stop? It's giving me a headache. <laughs> no, I love hearing it. I could never get bored of it. Oh, you just wait, Lizzie. I'm going to remind you of that when you're going, I wish that bird would stop singing. <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> All right, maybe I'm just clearly very grumpy, but I think they're wonderful. And they are, again, like Lizzie was saying, one of those birds that stays here for a lot longer than it used to do. It stays for longer. Some of them even, was it some of them even over winter now? Yeah, some of them are staying over winter. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Get to hear them all the time. Yay! <laughs> all right, we've got time, just enough time for our challenge. Is there okay. for a challenge? Right, I'm going to share my screen, guys, and it is challenge time. So each session, we like to share a challenge with you all to give a go um, before our next session, or even after that, give it a try sometime. So hopefully you can see what's on my screen, and I'm going to make it a bit bigger. There we go. So our main challenge this time is to see where your food comes from. And you're probably like, what? Why? Why do I need to see where my food comes from? And it's because they come from all over the world. The food that we have in our supermarkets comes from everywhere. So on the left, you can see, this is just something I had in my fridge today. We have strawberries from Kent. So that's not very far at all. It's just across the border from Surrey. But then I also had some grapes. And if you can see where, that, uh, where it says it comes from, hopefully you might be able to see my mouse, from South Africa. That is where some of our food comes from and not only there, all over the world. So we want you guys to have a look at what's in your fridge at the moment. And if you haven't got anything just yet and you're going to go food shopping, have a look at the fruit and veg when you go food shopping and tell us how far some of the food came from. Some of it is from South Africa. It could be Spain, all over the world. And the reason why we want this to be a challenge is because we want you guys to to have a look and see if maybe you can make a change one small change of where some food of yours comes from to make sure it comes from the uk or closer to home because if you imagine those grapes have been flown from south africa to the uk and that plane uses a lot of fuel which then releases those gases which we talked about and that is what's causing our earth to warm up it's one of the big problems as planes so have a look, see if you can make a change. Maybe you could even grow your own fruit and veg this summer, even in a window box or in your garden or at school, whatever it is, give it a try, that will really help. So that's our main challenge. Then we also have a link we're gonna send to you guys 
on how to reuse things. So this is a link that we'll send you. It's making a t-shirt to one that you might wear every day or your parents might wear, making an old t-shirt into a tote bag. So something you might carry over your shoulder, might put your shopping in, whatever it is you might use it for. Because reusing things and making sure we don't waste as much is another way we can really help our planet with climate change and also plastic pollution, all sorts. It really helps. And if you don't want to do that, maybe you have um, plastic water bottles you drink from every day, but you don't refill. Instead, try and refill them and use less plastic. There's lots of ways you can help. Let us know in the chat if there are ways that you any ideas you have as well to reuse things or give us an email as well. And lastly, there's other things you can do too. These are just options to give you ideas. You could save some water, whether it's brushing your teeth and making sure the tap's turned off when you're brushing in, um, saving energy at home, so turning off the heating a bit more and making sure you turn the lights off as you walk out the room, um, not using cars as much, so whether it's walking and cycling instead if you can, or even using public transport will really help. And of course, anything you do to help our wildlife, like growing flowers, hedgerows, um, making sure there's log piles like we talked about in the game, that will all really help our creatures to survive and also plants taking that carbon dioxide and make oxygen for us to breathe. So it'll be really good. So let us know what you guys get up to, but do give the first challenge a try to see where your food comes from. That will make a really big change. And please do let us know what you come up with, what you do, because we can put it in our art show next week, or we just love hearing your stories, to be honest. So anything, just let us know. We love it. Oh. I love it too. Timmy and Izzy say, when your trousers get too short, cut the bottoms off and turn them into shorts, which is a great Ooh, idea. Love it. Amazing. I like it. Oh, Ellie's pointed out, we're not doing next week, Lizzie. It's next month. <laughs> yes, next month. Oh, I, I keep wish. Too. I keep forgetting to. All right then, team. So that is it for today. But before you go, remember, we've got a little bit of time for the gallery. So some of you have been sending beautiful things into us, and I'm going to share that for you now. But just before we do, I want to give you a reminder. Our next session is not next week. It is on the 20th of May, and it is called helping wildlife at home it's our theme we're going to be thinking about wildlife gardening but not just gardens if you don't have a garden lots of ideas of how you can help wildlife at home in loads of different ways so that should be really fun if you signed up for this session but not for next one the link is different each time parents so please make sure you sign up for every session otherwise you don't get the link and you can't join so sign up tell your friends get everybody involved um send us anything you get up to in the next month it's a gorgeous month to be active and adventuring and very quickly 30 days wild our challenge every year for the month of june do one wild thing every day that's the challenge and we wouldn't ask you to do something that challenging without any help so if you sign up on our website then you'll get a free pack sent through the post with a calendar with stickers eco stickers i know how exciting and with uh, little idea cards, loads of little goodies in there. And it's absolutely free and you can sign up. We'll send it out to you and you can have a go at doing one wild thing every day, be it walking on the grass with bare feet and feeling mud between your toes Ooh. <laughs> or even camping out for one night. There's loads of different things you could do. We'll be full of ideas. And in June, we'll be doing a little bit of a special session all about it then as well. So if you want to sign up now, get thinking of ideas, you can tell us all about it. Um, I'm going to send you loads more things in the email tomorrow anyway. So if I've forgotten anything, I'll just mention it then. Right then, I think it's gallery time. Thank you, everybody. And thank, thank you, guys. So lovely to be back. I'll let Lizzie say her goodbyes while I close up what I'm doing. And I will see you all very soon, I hope. All right. Bye. Bye. And thank you guys so much. Thanks for interacting with us. We can't wait to see what you send in. It's been so nice to chat to you all again. And I can't wait until the 20th of May, not next week, um, to chat to you all again. But yeah, do let us know in the meantime. We love seeing what you guys get up to. See you later, everyone.